Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, Ellie, for asking me to talk about Brilliant Emerald. Um, it is, in fact, the species that's intrigued me for many, many years. And the more I observe it, probably the less I understand. And uh, I guess I've put on the title Britain's Least Recorded Dragonfly, which may seem a bit of a bold statement. So what I would like to do during the course of this talk is to perhaps justify that statement. But also I would say that it's probably one of our least, uh, least understood dragonflies. And also I think some of the recent observations I've made might shed some light on that. So what I want to cover today, So what I'm looking to cover today, if I go back, yeah, is the spatial distribution of the species in Britain, some first encounters with the dragonfly, the habitat requirements, then look at egg laying and larval development, and then moving on to the adults, I'd like to look at some early morning activity and territorial behavior, and then finish off by talking about some of the current threats. So anybody that's actually looked through the Dragonfly Atlas that was published in 2014 can't fail to be intrigued by the really bizarre distribution pattern of Brilliant Emerald. As you can see from these three maps, which are um, taken over a series of decades going back more than 50 years, you'll see that the distribution really hasn't changed much at all during that period. And you'll see that it occurs at two, in two areas in Scotland. And I'm not sure whether we've got Pat Batty on the call today, but I think Pat has informed me that a lot of the additional records have come as a result of um, extra recording activity. And it is still restricted to an area of Argyll and then the main area around the Glen Affric and Loch Bran areas. But even in England, you can see that from the time before 1980, the distribution hasn't really changed a great deal to the current day. There's been a little bit of infilling and the 1980 to 1999 period coincided with the first atlas in 1990. And then even to the current day, we've gained a few sites, but we've lost a few sites. And what is really intriguing is that there are absolutely no records anywhere in between. So that would suggest that the species is really poor at uh, dispersing into new areas. So I'll perhaps have a look at that in a few minutes. The other thing to say is that it's considered that the populations, particularly the one in Scotland, is a result of um, a post-glacial colonization. And then after the glaciers retreated, it uh, moved up into Scotland and then became isolated. And for many years, it was actually only known from Scotland and there were no records from England. But as I say, it's intrigued me for years as to why this distribution pattern sh should be as it is. So I make no apologies for today's talk being a very, very strong England bias on this one. So if we look at some of the reasons why, you'll see from this map that the distribution in England coincides remarkably with the distribution of counties where the woodland cover is greater than 15%. And let's just look at this in a little bit more detail. And this is some work that was done by the Wildland Research Institute at the University of Leeds. And they were actually looking at the feasibility of the introduction of the links into Britain. And they plotted the counties with certain percentage of woodland. And as you can see from this map, the distribution of brilliant emerald in, in England really coincides remarkably with this woodland cover. And it's almost hugging the same areas where the woodland cover is greater than 15%. Now you might notice that there's some red areas 
to the north of the distribution of brilliant emerald without any records. And this is largely the Chilterns and the North Downs, which are porous chalk with virtually no water bodies. You can then see the, the red area in the New Forest. There's a red area in the Forest of Dean and a red area in Dartmoor. But that's a long way for the dragonfly to disperse over open countryside. So it does seem to be very, very confined to this area of woodland. Now, the State of Dragonflies report that was published recently, um, what I've done is I've taken the data that was used. And firstly, I should say that it's regarded that the species distribution in Britain is stable. And I'll come back to it later, but I'd like you to notice in the, in the top chart, there is a peak during the early 1990s. And I will mention that and perhaps explain that later. But what I'd like to do is, I took the top eight least recorded dragonflies in Britain, and I've taken the number of records, looked at the number of records in Scotland, and then also expressed that as a percentage of the total. And as you can see, the Azure Hawker, Ishna cerulea, and the Northern Emerald, Somatochlora arctica, are virtually confined to Scotland. So if we were to take those two species out, Brilliant Emerald is certainly the least recorded dragonfly in England. If you then look at the top four and look at the number of records of Brilliant Emerald, Somatochlora metallica, against the other three species, you'll see that it's the least recorded of the four. So I think there is a fairly strong argument to say that Brilliant Emerald is Britain's least recorded dragonfly. Let me expand on that. And this photograph here is Swinley Brick Pits in Berkshire, just south of Bracknell. It's part of the Swinley Forest, which forms a extensive area of forestry that spreads across to Windsor. And I'd like to share some quotes from John Ward Smith, because he mentions that although the Brilliant Emerald is recorded at more sites than the Downy Emerald in this area, it's observed less often. He also then goes on to mention how elusive it is, how the females are rarely seen. He's got very little evidence of breeding and very rarely sees more than one adult brilliant emerald flying at any one time. And I have to confess that I've been to this area quite a number of times, and this particular pool, I've seen many, many downy emeralds, but only on two occasions have I ever seen a single brilliant emerald. And Des Sussex, in one of his uh, county dragonfly newsletters, reported in 2019 that there were only four records of brilliant emerald out of more than 4,000 records. So even in its real strongholds, it's very rarely seen. So first encounters with brilliant emerald, and wouldn't it be wonderful if brilliant emerald and dragonflies came and perched in front of the observer and enabled us to see all the details. And it's a species that rarely settles in close view of the observer. So you've got to be very, very lucky to see it. So what I'd like to do is just a couple of slides to show the comparison with downy emerald. And here you can see a brilliant emerald male and segment three of the abdomen is really pinched in. And then it slightly tapers out to the rest of the abdomen, which is almost parallel sided, ending in the anal appendages, which you can see are slightly curved inwards. If we compare that with the downy emerald, the downy emerald often appears somewhat darker. And again, the abdomen is pinched in at segment three and then quite rapidly tapers out to quite a bulbous abdomen finishing with the anal appendages, which as you can see here, are slightly curved outwards. So these are often the best features to look at and distinguish between the two species. But as often happens, they don't settle and you really often have to rely 
on identifying them in flight. And here we can see a downy emerald and a brilliant emerald in flight and in relatively good light. And you can almost see that the brilliant emerald just stands out, it glows. And in such lighting conditions, it really is quite um, easy to separate the two. And someone once said to me, if you're in any doubt as to which of the two species you're observing, you probably haven't seen a brilliant emerald. And I think that stands out very well when you see the two species flying together. But again, these flight photographs show that the bulbous abdomen of the downy emerald, the much darker coloration, but I'd also like to just draw your attention to the front of the head, to the fronds or the face. You'll notice that there are two very noticeable um, yellow patches either side of the, the head on the brilliant emerald, which on the downy emerald are, are not present, although occasionally the reflection of the light can give the impression of these yellow patches. But when you see the yellow and you've got your eye in, the, the jizz of the two dragonflies will separate them out. So, as I mentioned, there's going to be a very strong England bias in this talk, but um, Pat Batty very kindly provided me with a photograph of a typical Scottish site. And generally, the sites in Scotland, I think it's over about 90, over 90% 90 of them now are in very open lochens, some of which are at reasonable high altitudes which is much higher than any of the populations in England. And one of the characteristics of a lot of the Scottish sites is virtually vegetation-free water close to the bank. And as you can see here at this site in Argyll, there is no vegetation close to the bank. But the interesting thing is, and the significance of the kitchen colander in this photograph, is that Pat was able to use this colander and holding it at arm's length, was able to sample for larvae under the undercut, undercut banks along this lochan. And she was finding the larvae concealed, hiding in areas of sort of heather and sphagnum under the banks. And she mentioned to me that once this had been discovered, it then became a lot easier to find the larvae at other sites in Scotland. But as I say, they are very open lock and sites. And in contrast to many, many of the sites in England, this is a typical woodland site in England at the Wasing Estate in Berkshire. And it's completely surrounded by mixed woodland that comes right down to the bank side. And there's only a few areas of the bank where you can get reasonable access to see any dragonfly activity along the banks. And this particular site is quite intriguing because I've watched here many, many times. And again, I've seen lots of downy emeralds, but only occasionally has a brilliant emerald flown by. The other intriguing thing with this site is it's a very strong breeding population of white-legged damselfly which is not a species that you would normally associate to be uh, breeding alongside brilliant emerald. Now, I mentioned that peak in the State of Dragonflies report, and on further investigation, I found that 31% of all records from England of brilliant emerald have come from the Basingstoke Canal, which is quite remarkable. And the canal in its former heyday was a fantastic site for dragonflies and a very, very good site for brilliant emerald. But unfortunately, it was reopened to boat traffic in the 1990s. And this resulted in a major increase in water turbidity, a lot of disturbance, and dragonfly numbers went down considerably. It's also because of the water turbidity, a lot of the aquatic plants, the native aquatic plants were lost from the site. And unfortunately, somebody introduced a very invasive Carolina 
fan words, which is Kabomba Carolinensis. And that has dominated many areas of the canal. And really, it's probably not a very suitable habitat for some of the uh, rarer species, such as Brilliant Emerald. But as I say, at the heyday, it was a very, very important site for Brilliant Emerald. And it would have enabled it to colonize quite a few areas um, in Northeast Hampshire and Berkshire. Now, one of my study sites is Warren Heath, and it's a series of three reservoirs that appeared in the 1920s and 1930s. And this is the middle reservoir at Warren Heath. And for decades, this particular pool was in deep forestry. It was completely surrounded by coniferous um, wood and very, very shaded. And what was particularly interesting is that brilliant emerald, you could almost guarantee to see brilliant emerald on this particular pool. Whereas the other species, including downy emerald, black-tailed skimmer and four-spotted chaser, were almost absent from this pool, although they were present on some of the more open pools. Now, it's often stated that um, any clearance of woodland is detrimental to brilliant emerald. And similarly, any major habitat disturbance is detrimental to brilliant emerald. And it was quite interesting, but in 2008, there was a breach in the dam at Warren Heath, resulting in a major drop of water level. And as you can see here, the water level went down by probably one and a half to two meters exposing a lot of the margins. And as you can see here, the much of the substrate comprises twigs and organic de debris and almost anything that falls into the pond. And this, is, this would have been the habitat that brilliant emerald larvae were utilizing. Now, what I would like you to pay particular attention on is that, and this is a very good one for comparison, this pool is in deep shade, completely surrounded by dense forestry. In 2013, the plantation on the south side of the pool was completely taken out. All the trees along the margin were removed and the numbers of brilliant emerald were largely unaffected. So to suggest that trees are detrimental if they're removed is not entirely the full picture, but this site now is really, really good for brilliant emerald. And probably I've seen on social media that a lot of people regard this as one of the best places to see it. And as I'll discuss in a few minutes, I have actually stood on this bank in one place for up to six hours watching uh, brilliant emeralds. And that will be quite, significant for what I'm about to, to show you in a few minutes. Now, as John Ward Smith quoted in that slide I showed earlier, females and egg laying behavior are rarely seen. And I've equally um, failed to see very many ovipositing females, but there was one occasion last year at Escher Common at Black Pond, I saw a female brilliant emerald ovipositing in this one small area for a total of seven minutes. And she was repeatedly thrusting her end of her abdomen into the area that is in the top left-hand corner of this picture. And you should be able to see a very bright green birch leaf and there is my spectacularly dreadful photograph of the female trying to egg lay, but it does give you an impression of the sort of substrate that she was trying to egg lay into. Now, what has been interesting is that there's been a lot of controversy in a lot of the publications on Brilliant Emerald as to how it egg lays. And there was even at one time a suggestion that females in Scotland had a different way of egg laying to the females in England. And 
I think now with more observations, this is simply, there is very little difference. It's just that the substrate varies between sites. But even with this appallingly bad photograph, you can see that at the end of the abdomen, the anal appendages and the tenth segment are held vertically, while the very long um, extended vulva scale, which is highlighted here, sticks down perpendicularly from the abdomen. And I'm going to show the next slide, which is a video from Shutterstock. And here is a female egg laying. And you can see the sort of habitat that she's egg laying into, but she would be flying around repeatedly stabbing into this substrate. And again, you can see the anal appendages held vertically and the vulva scale perpendicularly downwards. And I think I, I saw Dave Sadler is on the call today. And David has a very, very nice photograph on the Sussex Dragonflies website. And I think this shows very, very nicely, again, how those anal appendages are held vertically and the vulva scale, the long projection coming down perpendicularly under the abdomen. And I, there's been various quotes, and I think Philip Corbett probably got um, closest in, he was saying that this is a mechanism for very precisely positioning the eggs into the substrate compared to other species such as downy emerald that will just scatter the eggs over open water. And when I've been looking for larvae, I've noticed with brilliant emerald, they always occur closer to the bank than all the other species do. And I'm putting this photograph up now of a brilliant emerald larvae, and I wouldn't be surprised if initially people thought, well, where is it? I can't see it. And this was photographed in its natural substrate, in that organic debris. And as you can see, it is incredibly well camouflaged. And for those still struggling, this is what it looks like if it's in a clear water tank. And the most obvious thing is that it's got these very large dorsal spines along the abdomen that differentiate it from most other species, including downy emerald. So quite an easy dragonfly larvae to identify. And I just put this in for intrigue because it's obviously catching prey in these very dark um, areas that it inhabits. And it always intrigues me that the, the labial um, mask on the front of the head, which it uses to capture its prey, is very well served by tracheals and nerves and all these spines, which are very effective at catching probably the coronamid midge larvae, the blood worms that are, in, are sort of inhabiting this habitat. Right, moving on to adult activity. For my sins, I quite often get up early and go out dragonfly watching at dawn. And as I say, my study site at Warren Heath, I've usually been present before six o'clock. And this is the 13th of June last year. And the air temperature at this time of the day was 16.5 degrees C. And there is already a dragonfly flying over water in that photograph. Now, on this particular occasion, at 13th of June, it's a little bit too early for brilliant emerald. And in fact, that dragonfly, which is in the bottom right third of the image, um, was a downy emerald. But the same day, I had quite a lot of brilliant emeralds emerging, and I was finding exuvia along the bank on the right-hand side of this photograph. But as the month progresses, brilliant emerald would start to fly towards the end of June and into July. And similar early morning visits into July, I found these very large swarms of midges flying over the water and brilliant emerald males were flying into the swarms and catching the midges. And it's often said that brilliant emerald do not feed over water or rarely feed over water. 
Well, <clears throat> certainly the observations I've had now going back for over a decade suggest the opposite. They regularly feed over water during these early morning patrol flights. And here we can see a brilliant emerald male that has just caught a midge and is eating it. So they do feed over water. <clears throat> I've also noticed brilliant emerald males will hover and investigate any movement around the margins. And as you can see here, there is a brilliant emerald male that was attracted to the movement of a pond skater. And I thought maybe it's going to catch it, but it made no attempt to grab it. So it's clearly distinguishing between the different types of prey that it will take. There are also in a number of publications and field guides, very prescriptive measures of how far brilliant emeralds fly above water and from the bank. And on this particular occasion, on the 22nd of July, it was early morning between, I was there between seven and, well, between seven and nine, there were up to six to eight brilliant emerald males flying over this pool. They were flying in open sunshine, open water, really doing everything that it says they don't do. So these early morning times when the temperature is still quite cool, brilliant emerald males seem to be more active than when later in the day, the temperatures possibly get too warm for them. The other thing that tends to happen is that as the temperature warms up, you get more species such as black-tailed skimmer and four-spotted chaser that become more aggressive and they start to compete with the brilliant emerald and it doesn't seem to be able to compete very well and then it will just leave the water. So territorial behavior, on one occasion, I saw this male flying at five to seven in the morning and it had a clearly damaged wing. And I sat at that one spot for up to six hours watching what, what was coming by. And this particular male, which was clearly identifiable by two tears in the wing, which was causing that damage to the wing, it kept repeatedly coming back to the same area to hover. And I also noticed that its patrol flights were very short and it would clash with other males. So the conclusion I made is that the territory is density dependent and they are regularly hovering in areas when there are other males present. And even half an hour later, there was this other male, male number two, which again had very clear markings on the wings that enabled me to identify it from photographs. And I did in fact find a third male in that same area. So over a two hour period, I had three different males in that one spot holding territory. And as the temperature increases and you get more competition from other more aggressive species, Brilliant Emerald does then start to patrol in shade. And as you can see here, this is a male patrolling the margins at that, that particular pool at five to 11. And the air temperature at this time was 22 degrees C. And this was a day when the afternoon temperature got up to 30 degrees. And by midday, there were no Brilliant Emeralds flying. They'd completely left the water. So finally, just to finish off, <clears throat> to mention a few threats. I mentioned about the increased both boat traffic along the Basing Stoke Canal, increasing turbidity. Similarly, the introduction of lots of fish, particularly carp, bottom feeding carp, are detrimental to Brilliant Emerald. But at, this is the moat pond at Thursley back in 2006. And this particular spot was very, very good for Brilliant Emerald and Downy Emerald. Looking at the same place today, the bank is highly eroded. A lot of the ve vegetation has gone and there is relentless um, disturbance by people wanting to feed the geese, um, bathe their dogs, play with their dogs. 
And really the, the whole site is now under threat uh, in the main areas where brilliant emeralds would be likely to be egg laying and breeding. And similarly, a site at Brams Hill Plantation, this pool, which is mid pool, was at one time completely surrounded by forestry. And then they decided to remove most of the trees to allow greater public access to dogs and horses. And there's a lot more vegetation, disturbance, and brilliant emerald is hardly ever seen there now. So finally, as I'm nearly, nearly run out of time, in conclusion, very quickly, brilliant emerald is a scarce dragonfly. The adults are active much earlier in the day than previously reported. So I think there is an opportunity for people to get out there much earlier and try and record brilliant emerald. The patrolling and hovering flight patterns vary considerably and they are density dependent. In England, it occurs in areas with extensive woodland cover. And I think this is very important to buffer the temperatures and to keep it within the tolerances that brilliant emerald adults will fly in. Also, the bank, the bank side structure is quite important for egg laying and larval development. And again, there's probably not a lot of difference between the sites in Britain, uh, sorry, in, in England compared to those in Scotland. And Steve Brooks once mentioned to me that he was trying to work on uh, looking at the DNA of different populations of brilliant emeralds, but I think that work never got uh, continued and there is still a big opportunity for somebody to start looking at the gene markers of the different populations of brilliant emerald and to perhaps try and determine their origins. So finally, I would like to suggest, and I'm open to discussion on this, but Brilliant Emerald does appear to be certainly England's least recorded dragonfly, if not Britain's. So I'd like to thank everybody for listening and be happy to answer any questions in the discussion later on.